Welcome back to Sputnik and our stroll through the 2021 archives. Cancel culture ran through 2021 like the word Blackpool through a seaside stick of rock. From the Rhodes statue in Oxford to the vicious sex gender debate, which saw J.K. Rowling cancelled. Absurdly, she was even disinvited to her own Harry Potter party. Probably the best summing up of freedom of speech came from Andrew Doyle, who came onto the show at the beginning of the year. George asked him about his take on free speech, but first described his own experiences growing up. Your book, Free Speech and Why It Matters. Why does it matter that people should be free to call me as they did throughout my childhood, a, a fenian of indeterminate parentage? Why is it important that they can call my mixed race children uh, much uh, even more foul names? Uh, wh why, why does it matter uh, that, uh, that uh, wicked people are free to speak their wickedness? Because the principle of free speech is far bigger than the uh, kind of odious people that you describe. Uh, we should all be always be disapproving of, of the kind of behaviour that you're talking about there. Uh, when I'm defending free speech, I'm not necessarily defending the substance of the speech that is uttered. What I'm defending is the right of people to speak their minds as they see fit, whether I like it or not. Uh, and that's the price you pay for a free society, is that some people are going to use their free speech to say some horrible things. Uh, the question shouldn't be uh, about the substance of what is being said, but do we want to give anyone else, such as the state, such as big tech, uh, the right to decide what speech is acceptable and what speech is not acceptable. That's, that's the real question. You know, if you go back to when the ACLU defended the neo-Nazis' right to march in Skokie in Chicago back in the 70s, uh, I mean, that seems counterintuitive in a way because obviously these were odious people uh, and it looked like anti-Semitic provocation for its own sake. Uh, but as, as the ACLU at the time said, the reason that they defended their right is in order to defeat Nazism because you can't defeat bad ideas without the principle of free speech. Freedom of speech transcends everyone. It's not about left or right. It's, it's about the bigger principle. It is the seedbed of all of our freedoms. It's the seedbed of all of our freedoms. That's true. Uh, it's the seedbed because um, I was slow to come to this point of view, but events are marching in a way that absolutely vindicates Doyle. Uh, because not only is the state now censoring and constantly redrawing the lines of what is acceptable speech, but perhaps even less acceptably, uh, big tech is doing it. Mm. Uh, at least the state has a government which is elected yes, by people. Exactly. But big tech is elected by nobody. Uh, but they have the power to expel people from the public square uh, and non-person them. Uh, once upon a time, uh, Winnie Mandela uh, was uh, non-person. She could literally not be quoted or photographed or shown. She was disappeared from the earth. I remember it well. I went to see her uh, in Brantford in South Africa. Now we have a situation where when Donald Trump was excluded from virtually all social media platforms, a lot of people with politics like mine, uh, rejoiced at that. Mm -hmm. But of course the truth is that they come for Donald mm -hmm. Trump today, mm -hmm. they may well come for you tomorrow. They may come for you and me the day after that. The 45th president of America banned from social media. While he was still in office. While he was still in office. This must be big, censorship, uh, censorship tyranny, and cancel uh, culture, so. But you see, uh, it's classic because many people hated what Trump was saying, they rejoiced when he was stopped from saying it, mm -hmm. not knowing that they themselves would be hoist on that very same petard. That's the truth of it. Let's go to Scotland, where they've got quite a cancel culture as well, by the way. Uh, but Glasgow, it hosted the COP26 summit, and we did our bit by looking at the environmental disaster in Ecuador. Activist and lawyer Stephen Donziger, at the time of recording, had been under house arrest for over 600 days, and he faced U.S. contempt of court charges. Let's have a look. 
It's a long story. I'm going to try to tell it in about a minute. Basically, I went down to Ecuador as a young lawyer in the early 1990s with a group of people. We saw an apocalyptic environmental disaster caused by Chevron. Deliberately, they dumped billions of gallons of toxic waste into the environment. It's been confirmed by various courts in Ecuador. Um, we decided to file a lawsuit on behalf of the indigenous groups in the Amazon that have been victimized by these practices. Um, so began an 18-year legal odyssey that culminated in 2011 with a historic victory in Ecuador's courts where Chevron wanted the trial held um, in favor of the indigenous communities. And that was for the amount of around 18 or 19 billion dollars. The Supreme Court of Ecuador affirmed the judgment but reduced the damages award to half that amount, about nine and a half billion dollars. And once that happened, Chevron refused to pay. They threatened the indigenous groups with a lifetime of litigation if they persisted in, in not in their claims. And they adopted a strategy to demonize me. It's in the company emails. And as part of that, they got a United States judge to issue all sorts of cost orders on me, claiming I had done unethical things in Ecuador, which is completely false because the case has been affirmed by 29 different appellate judges. But this one judge in the US ordered me to turn over my computer and cell phone to Chevron. When I resisted that, he charged me with criminal contempt of court and he locked me up on August 6, 2019 in my own home. That's what you get when you fight these multi-million dollar companies. Multi-billion. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he then, after that interview, went to jail. So not content with 600 days of house arrest, he was six, seven weeks actually behind bars. And now he's back under house arrest. So this case is still running. But the oil company has still not paid uh, the uh, indigenous people the damages uh, that court after court after court in Ecuador ordered them to do. Well, this is right out of Catch-22, Milo Minderbender. We thought there was a justice system in the US. Uh, we knew it wasn't great. But it turns out you can have a private parallel justice system that can lock you up under house arrest and even get you thrown behind bars. Unfortunately, this didn't get much attention at COP26. They were uh, more intent on focusing on uh, other things, <laughs> on plastic straws, yeah. Uh, but then what happens to poor indigenous people in Ecuador was not that interesting to those flying in on their private jets. Uh, to Glasgow. In Glasgow, you couldn't move for private jets yeah. and for big cavalcades Cav yeah. of gas guzzling uh, four by fours uh, as uh, the great and the good jetted in. Not just the political great and the good, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. but also the Hollywood stars that like to hang around on the edge of these kind of events. Now, a developing story we covered in the middle of the year failed to get traction anywhere else. A key figure in the assigned circle admitted that he had fabricated parts of the carry evidence in the American indictment against Assange. A young journalist called Bjartmar Alexanderson broke the story. Well, I interviewed the main witness uh, in the Assange case. And that witness, according to the indictment, is called teenager in NATO country one. And the te that teenager is Mr. Sigurd Fordason an Icelandic citizen, and uh, NATO country one is actually Iceland. So what um, I revealed after about nine hours of interview with him and uh, going over a few thousand chat logs uh, regarding his communications while he was working for uh, WikiLeaks in a minor role and also working for the US government at the time as an FBI informant, uh, it seems that the indictment and what is says in the indictment and what Mr. Sears Thorderson tells me does not add up. And this is quite important because this his testimony comes in the updated indictment of the US government in the case against Julian Assange. And the, in this updated uh, 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 indictment, they are trying to paint the picture of Mr. Assange as a an hacker and not a journalist. And therefore, they can get away and, and release themselves away from the so-called New York Times problem, which the Obama administration had. So this story was covered 
Nowhere. <laughs> Quite. Nowhere. Crucial. First crucial. of all, who knew that Iceland was country number one? <laughs> uh, uh, makes you wonder <laughs> what country number 155 uh, is. This means that the most powerful country in the world has based a criminal indictment that has caused enormous upheaval in the British justice system and in public opinion across the whole world on the testimony of a young boy at the time uh, who was an American agent at the time who has been convicted of sexual offenses against children, fraud, and has been several times sent to prison for various criminal activities. Yeah, uh, no wonder nobody covered that story. Because if they did cover that story, it would make the Julian Assange case look even more ridiculous than it already does. Can you imagine if you told the general public in Britain, in America, in Australia, across the world, that the word of such a man yeah. was the building block for a criminal indictment yeah against the world-famous publisher yeah, yeah. and journalist. All based on a con man. I mean, it's really unbelievable. I mean, con we... man's a good word. I mean, we just watched uh, Catch Me If You <laughs> Can. Uh, this man's much more of a con man yeah, uh, than Leo DiCaprio yeah. was in and, that And film. meanwhile, uh, uh, Assange is, of course, still behind bars. Uh, we don't know whether he's going to may even make 2022. No, we don't know it if is... he'll be alive for us to talk about. Uh, next yeah. year. Now, what about our predictions for 2022? Anything to rejoice about? Uh, well, Manchester United will not be the champions of England, <laughs> but they might win the Champions League, depending on the luck of the draw. Uh, Boris Johnson will not be the Prime Minister of Britain by the end of 2022. And Keir Starmer might not be the leader of the opposition oh, really? by the end of 2022. But the Conservatives will still be firmly in power <clears throat> and uh, the Labour Party will still be in opposition. Uh, Gosh, you would just Donald Trump you know. will confirm uh, that he uh, will run for president in 2024. I don't know if that's something that will make you rejoice <laughs> or yeah. weep. Uh, the Democrats will lose their control of the Senate and the House of Representatives. And President Joe Biden might take to a bath chair and be pushed, hopefully not across the cliffs, uh, by Vice President Kamala Harris. He'll still be president, uh, but he'll be uh, fading somewhat and visibly in the course uh, of 2022. COVID uh, might run out of steam. If Omicron is as virulent in transmission as it now seems to be, but as non-lethal for most people uh, as it seems to have become in South Africa, it might be that by next Christmas in 2022, we look back at the era of the coronavirus. Here's hoping anyway.